Managing acute and chronic kidney injury pharmacologically can be a bit tricky. Here we will explain the differences between them and the management in 7 minutes or less. To make it easier, let's first know the rule of kidneys. We have to keep in our minds that kidneys are vital organs responsible for clearing waste products and reabsorbing essential nutrients and minerals like sodium, potassium, glucose, phosphorus, calcium, and magnesium. Also, kidneys secrete important hormones like erythropoietin, which regulate red blood cells production, renin, which regulate blood pressure, and calcitrol, which is the active form of vitamin D. So when the kidneys get acutely injured or damaged chronically, all of these mechanisms will be messed up and we have to compensate that in a pharmacological and non-pharmacological way. So what is the difference between acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease? In acute kidney injury, it is caused by a prompt decrease in the kidney function, making the kidneys unable to secrete waste products, like serum creatinine, which is a breakdown product from muscles that should be excreted by the kidneys. Also, the urine output will be decreased. That is why AKI is categorized based on these levels, as in this table by the KDGO guidelines. While in CKD, there is a structural or functional abnormalities of the kidneys for more than three months, manifested by kidney damage with or without decreased GFR, which is the average filtration rate of each nephron, or in other words, it is a test to see how well the kidneys function. It estimates how much blood passes through the glomeruli which acts as tiny filters in the kidneys. So, CKD is classified into stages depending on the GFR and the amount of albumin in the urine, as in this table. For the signs and symptoms for both, a person with AKI will have high levels of serum creatinine and blood urea nitrogen, and will have decreased level of urine output, and some electrolyte abnormalities like hyperkalemia and hypermagnesemia. Also might have edema because of fluid accumulation. Well, in CKD, patient will experience different complications since the kidney is not working in a proper way. So, patient will experience anemia because of reduced erythropoietin, hyperparathyroidism, and electrolyte imbalances. Now, for the causes, in AKI, it's classified based on where would the injury happen. So, in prerenal injury, the problem happens before the blood enters the kidneys, so the kidney itself is not damaged. So, when the kidney experience low perfusion of blood because of dehydration, the body can usually compensate by dilation of the afferent arteriole, which is mediated by prostaglandin, and constricting the efferent arteriole, which is mediated by angiotensin II, to maintain the hydrostatic pressure within the glomerulus. In case of severe volume loss, this mechanism may be inefficient. Anything that constricts the afferent like NCAIDS medication by inhibiting prostaglandin will reduce the blood flow, or ACE and ARBs medication that inhibit angiotensin II will dilate the efferent arteriole and affect the intraglomerular pressure. In intrinsic injury, the structural damage is in the kidney itself because of autoimmune disorders like lupus and nephrotoxic agents like contrast media and drug-induced kidney injury like some antibiotics. In postrenal injury, here there is an obstruction within the urinary system that obstructs the urine outflow of the kidneys. This happens usually because of benign prostatic hypertrophy or stones. For CKD, it can be developed secondary to diapetes and hypertension and after damage happened by some factors that can cause faster decline in the kidney functions like hyperglycemia, uncontrolled blood pressure, and proteinuria. Now, let's talk about the management. In case of AKI, it's pretty simple. That will be according to the underlying cause. So, in case of pre-renal, patients will need fluids to replace the lost volume and vasopressors to improve the renal blood flow and patient's hemodynamics. If the injury is intrinsic, treat the cause, then it is important to stop using all nephrotoxic agents. While in post-renal injury, the solution is first to remove the obstruction if possible. Sometimes dialysis may be started in some severe cases depending on the AKI stage. Also diuretics such as loop diuretics can be used if there is a fluid overload or hyperkalemia. In CKD, we mainly manage complications that patients come with. We will start with electrolyte imbalances. First, we have hypernatremia. We must restrict salt intake and treat it with diuretics such as loop diuretics and thiazides. Second, we have hyperkalemia. We have three options, either hemodialysis, or pharmacologically by sodium polystyrene sulfonate, which is an insoluble polymer that exchanges sodium with potassium in the gut, or removing potassium from the body 
by redistributing potassium or shifting it intracellularly by insulin or albuterol by activating the sodium-potassium ATPase. Third, hyperparathyroidism. As we said before, kidneys secrete the active form of vitamin D, calcitrol, that normally increases calcium absorption and suppresses parathyroid hormone. Since it is damaged now, we will have high levels of PTH, and the way to manage this is by either taking vitamin D analogs such as calcitrol, and the side effects may be hypercalcemia, or taking calcium emetics like Sinecalcet, which increases the sensitivity of calcium sensing receptors on the parathyroid gland to suppress the PTH secretion, and side effects may be hypocalcemia and malagia. Fourth, we have hyperphosphatemia. Because of decreased kidney elimination, taking phosphate binders can help with that to facilitate the excretion of phosphate out of the body. We have calcium base like carbonate, which can cause constipation and hypercalcemia, and aluminum paste like aluminum hydroxide, which can cause constipation and aluminum toxicity. Also, we have sevilomer, which can cause dyspepsia and abdominal pain. And last complication that we're gonna discuss is anemia. People with CKD might have decreased erythropoietin production or might lose blood from dialysis. The way to manage that is by either taking erythropoietin stimulating agents or iron therapy. For ESA, we have epoietin alpha and darbipoietin alpha, and there is a black box warning on them, so we should use the lowest dose needed to prevent blood transfusion, and they can increase the risk of death and serious cardiovascular events when administered to target a hemoglobin level for more than 12 gram per deciliter. For iron therapy, we have oral irons like ferrous sulfate and ferrous gluconate, and they can cause constipation, metallic taste, and dark stool. For the IV iron, we have iron dextran and iron sucrose, and there is a black box warning on iron dextran that it can cause anaphylactic reaction, so test dose is required. And that's it for CKD and AKI. Hope that this video helped you to arrange your ideas about them. And if it's helped, please share it with everyone you know. Thank you for watching.